you are going to learn the ins and outs of building a competitive gene stealer cult army, including unit selection, tactics, and synergies to dominate the tabletop. I was undecided on which way to do it, to explain the reasons behind the list and then show the army list, or show off the army list and then explain why. I went with the second one so that netlisters can come in, grab it and go, but they won't understand the why and knowing how to use an army is way more important than the list itself. I've gone with a thousand points because many tournaments and competitive games run at that level and it is not a level normally catered to with other videos, while a lot of you play quite often at that size. 1k is a very different beast to 2k and there are the same number of objectives, the same requirements from mission cards, and yet you have half the units to try and succeed. With five objectives, your opponent may only have five units. Fewer if they're elite, and so any losses they take prevent them from holding an objective. There is no second wave or screening units, unless you're playing Tyranid Endless Swarm or Imperial Guard. While Gene Stealer Cult have more freedom at 1k and can rank better than the meta would suggest because we can recycle units and maneuver quickly to hold empty objectives. Here is the list which I will read out for the visually impaired and so you don't need to tab out of the game you're playing, look away from nature if you're walking and you don't need to look up from whatever you are painting. I have a Patriarch and 10 Gene Stealers, a Nexus with 20 Neophytes, 10 Neophytes by themselves, a Reductus Saboteur, an Achilles Ridge Runner, and a Primus with 10 Acolytes. Weapon options, the Gene Stealers and Patriarch are fixed. The Neophytes can be equipped with a lot of different weapons, but I've done a separate video on using them. The Reductus Saboteur is fixed, and the Achilles Ridge Runner, there are several different combos you can go for. Again, explained in way more detail in a different video. The Primus with the 10 Acolytes, I went with three demo charges, because at 1000 point that's usually enough, you could go for four, but I like having one heavy mining weapon to punch out tougher enemies in combat after we've thrown the demo charges. At 1000 points we can't afford this unit to be a once and done, and it also is a lot of our points investment at this size of game. Now this list is not the only way to do it, there are others, this is the list that I am most comfortable with and importantly have the models for. I know you could play on tabletop simulator, but I find that slow and less fun than seeing an opponent's fully painted or mostly painted army. You could have a Biophagus and Inscrutable Cunning with five aberrants instead of the Gene Stealers, but that adds too many points so something would have to give and change. You could have a Biophagus with Inscrutable Cunning and ten Metamorphs. The Hand Flamers can be very irritating first turn against the right target, and we are infiltrating so we should be able to pick our target, and then straight away we use the Biophagus once per game ability so that we haven't wasted it if we get wiped out too soon. The models in the unit can come back with a cult icon and if wiped out in the first turn, which they probably will be, they come back on a 4+. plus. Or you could do this with combat acolytes and charge with claws and mining weapons and they are as a battle line unit even more likely to return, but I prefer gene stealers. I can hide them behind a building first turn, so if I don't go first they are mostly safe, if I do go first then I have the speed to move, advance and, because of their special rule, to charge. This lets my gene stealers kill an enemy unit or type a valuable part of the enemy army. If they have to spend the first turn locked in combat or falling back, perhaps risking a desperate breakout, then they are not moving up the board to take objectives, perform actions and shoot other things. I can also hold the gene stealers back for a turn if the enemy is naturally slow, like death guard infantry. We have, with this list, many many options for how to play it. Now the art of list building and crafting the perfect 40k tournament army, yours may not look anything like mine, because you have different models, a different style of play, or you just don't want some random vampire with a hair flick to be telling you what to do. But every unit in your army needs to have a clear goal. These are the five things that your units need to do. Every unit at 1000 points should be doing at least two of them. They need to hold objectives, kill enemies, support units, delay enemies, and perform secondary actions. For holding objectives, even at 1000 points, when you are using the Leviathan mission deck there are usually five objectives. We need to hold three of them to score maximum victory points and have those objectives available so that we can perform actions on them, or complete secondary objectives like secure no man's land. Unless we can keep the enemy away from all of the midboard due to them being mostly dead or held up, then we are going to need to hold our own objective and two in no man's land to get the most victory points, although this depends on the mission we drew. Purge the foe doesn't give you any points for having two objectives, it needs at least one and still more than your opponent, so holding three will guarantee that. Priority targets is the only one of the nine missions that doesn't give you more points if you have more objectives than your opponent, but we can't just rely on that mission coming up. Killing the enemies? Every dead enemy is one less objective they can control, 
so if you can take out just over half their army, then you can go on the defensive, which seems an odd thing to think of, and hold the objectives as best you can. Supporting units is what most characters do. They make one of your units better. So the Ridge Runner has the crossfire rule to make acolytes and neophytes better. That is why I include it. Plus, it is a fast unit to perform secondary actions, and depending on the weapon it has, can kill some kind of enemy unit. I recommend having something to delay enemies. If you can spend a few points on a screening unit that is a couple of models to get in the way of your more valuable units, you can stop your own units being tied up. This will delay the enemy from getting to your good squads. Or you can tie up the enemy in combat blobs. So this can be lots of regenerating models, something like 10 Necron Warriors. Neophytes can do it because we have a lot of models and they can regenerate with the cult icon. But my favorite is Gene Stealers because of their multiple wounds and their invulnerable save. And we can get to the enemy very quickly, stopping them from getting onto the objectives. And last of all, secondary actions. We need to have enough small units to be able to get around the board, hold four table quarters, be on an objective and cleanse it, and appear in the enemy backlines. This is why if this was a Tyranid list, I would be suggesting including a Biovort to throw spore mines and do all these things, and include lots of individual Ripper Swarms. Now that I've mentioned the five main things we need to do, if you have a tournament tactical mindset, you should be able to look at my list and have a pretty good idea of what is doing what and where, but I'll explain in more detail. The Acolytes with the Primus and the Neophytes with the Nexus are underground. In competitive games using the Leviathan mission deck, you can't have more than half your units or more than half your points in reserve. We are putting exactly 500 points in reserve. If the points on these units were to change upwards, we would have to rethink this. But for now, it works. The Acolytes are there to kill things with their bombs and remove enemies from objectives. So we use our demo charges and then in the following turns, the combat. Demo charges are temporary, Heavy mining weapons are forever. That and I didn't convert a bunch of really cool weapons only to not use them. But if the unit is wiped out and then comes back through the cult ambush markers, then we get the demo charges back and can advance and throw them because they're assault weapons. So we have a 13 to 18 inches threat range from the cult ambush marker. Because of their weakness of being a one wound model with a five plus save, they're not great at holding things. So they can only hold objectives if there's nothing around to threaten them. They do kill enemies quite well, and once they've done their job of killing an enemy unit with the demo charges, we can have them in the enemy backline to score secondaries on that. We can have them on objectives and perform actions to cleanse them. Or if we don't have any secondaries that require that, we return them to the shadows so that they can appear on an objective that's empty, or be nine inches away from the enemy to try and charge them. Then we can get the most out of that mining weapon and all of their claws, which fully reroll hit rolls because of the Primus. The Primus is very much a support character. He is not just supporting the Acolytes to give them the rerolls to hit, he is also supporting the rest of the army. So if the points of the Acolytes, the Neophytes, the Primus, the Nexus went up, we would have to deploy one of those units on the board, but because of the Primus's ability, he can move them off the board, even though we have reached the maximum number of points and units that we would normally be allowed to have off the board in reserves. So what you could do is deploy the neophytes on the board on, say, the far right flank, so your opponent thinks, okay, I'm going to need to match them there, otherwise they can walk straight onto an empty objective. Then we use the primus to put them underground, and now one of your opponent's units that was going to be geared up for killing lots of infantry is now horribly out of position. Shenanigans and mind games. This is delaying the enemy. The 20 neophytes can be rather good at killing enemy units, and because there's so many of them, they can hold objectives, perhaps multiple objectives. For their weapon choices, I do have another video that goes into a lot more detail about how to use them, but in short, there isn't particularly a bad choice for weapons. Even four heavy stubbers that are firing 24 shots at close range, but hitting on threes at AP minus one, is doing okay. How do we get them to that level? We use this stratagem. And even when the Acolytes are coming from reserve to use that stratagem at the same time, we can use it again because the Nexus gives us a free battle tactic stratagem, even one that's already been used on the board already. So the Acolytes turn up, use it first, then the Nexus is able to use it with his neophytes. The Nexus also lets you cover up mistakes. With the Cult Infiltration, if you deploy a Cult Ambush Marker too close to the enemy and it looks like they might be able to get it in their turn, you can move it six inches further away. Or, 
If you're pretty certain that the enemy is going to rush towards an objective and take it, you could move the cult ambush closer so that you're able to counter charge or to provide a very tempting alternative as the enemy moves towards the ambush marker to get rid of it instead of getting victory points. Once again, we're delaying the enemy and supporting our own units. The 20 neophytes have the bodies and regeneration to hold a mid-board objective. While there are a lot of different units that can wipe out 20 neophytes in one turn, they often have to get lucky because this is 1000 points. If you are putting everything into one big murder ball, it's vulnerable to being delayed, it's vulnerable to misdirection, and using stratagems like Return of the Shadows and One with Darkness can effectively neutralize the enemy Death Star without us ever having to fight it. Although the Acolytes with the demo charges that have Blast should be able to take out anything really tough or with a lot of bodies. And with 20 neophytes, we should be able to hold two midboard objectives if you string them out. Remember that unlike in 9th edition, objectives are controlled model by model. You no longer have to pick which objective you are contesting. It gives you more places to perform secondary actions if required for mission cards like cleanse. And their own special ability kicks in to generate additional command points, potentially. We can only get one extra command point per battle round, and it only happens on a 4+, plus, which is why we have the second group of 10 neophytes. They hold our home objective so that every turn from the start of the game, we could potentially be getting an additional command point. And the Gene Stealer Cult are a very command point hungry faction. Ideally, you will want to deploy this unit out of line of sight. If terrain doesn't allow for it, this is when we can use one with the darkness to stop them being shot in the early game. The saboteur has lone operatives, so shouldn't be shot anyway, unless the enemy gets within 12 inches, but they can perform actions. They can hold objectives and with their lone operative, the enemy will have to get quite close or probably charge her to remove her. Just don't put her too close to the enemy because if the enemy gets within 12 inches of her, the lone operative doesn't count anymore. We're relying on stealth and a one-off bomb to prevent the enemy from killing a very weak model. The Reductus can also kill enemies, just a little from her indirect fire bombs, or getting really close for the once per game demo charge, but hitting on a 2+, unlike the Acolyte's 5+. Oh, and we also get grenades for free. Remember to use them before you throw your demo charge. This can be quite a lot of damage to an enemy, but against most any enemy, we're gonna die pretty quickly to Overwatch if the enemy chooses to use that stratagem. One of the Reductus Saboteur's big vulnerabilities is deep striking enemies. Her planted bomb doesn't activate against reserves that arrive within 12 inches of her. But if the enemy wants to drop a deep striking unit on her that they've spent a lot of points on to kill one 50-ish point model, that's a win for us. Deep striking units with guns tend to cost a lot of points. Seraphim are great because they don't cost a lot of points, so I would include one of them in my 1000 point sisters tournament list. But this isn't about sisters. I usually deploy the Saboteur first to screen any enemy infiltrators away from me. We already know that the Acolytes and Neophytes are going to go underground. And we know that the smaller squad of Acolytes is going to go on the home objective, so we don't need to worry about where they are going. The Ridge Runner will go on the opposite flank to the Saboteur so that we can reach two objectives in the first turn for actions and complete secondaries like attempting target. The Gene Stealers are here to tie up the enemy units, preferably something fast in your opponent's army that could get to an objective and start performing actions. Or we tie up something in the enemy army that's going to struggle to cut through the Gene Stealers usually units that have damage one attacks. I deploy the gene stealers last so that I can see what the enemy has. Remember you can put the acolytes and the neophytes on the board and then use the primus to take them off the board before the game starts. This gives you some extra drops so that the enemy is deploying valuable assets and you are just putting down units that you're just going to take off in a second anyway. So avoid flamer units like the infernus marines holding up a tank and making it retreat so it can move on in its next turn instead of advancing can swing you five victory points so we can strike at the enemy's big guns or something that provides very valuable support and if we did mess up with the gene stealers and ended up deploying them in a very bad place the primus even off the board can bring them to safety but the faq expectation is that they won't be able to use the infiltrate ability when redeploying I know we deployed the saboteur first and we're planning to screen her with the gene stealers but if that flank is not viable either accept that she's going to go down blowing up part of the enemy or we redeploy her as well including the patriarch with the gene stealers is optional and he could be swapped out for another reductus with prowling adjutant to perform actions and add even more of a boom or we could have a heavy weapon squad with las cannons or mortars or have a unit of cadians to sticky objective markers sticky objectives is very valuable at 1000 points when we've already said 
you probably don't have enough units to hold all five objectives. This is the cheat way. The drawback is you can't use stratagems like one with darkness to keep them safe. They don't have a cult icon to regenerate models. They don't have the cult ambush ability because it's not listed on their data sheet as one of their main rules. And they don't get it just because they're in a gene stealer cult army. And they only get command points on a 5 plus, and that is only if you spend a command point to do a stratagem on them. The neophytes can always try and generate an extra command point as long as they're on the objective. But I like the Patriarch for the devastating wounds to make the gene stealers more deadly, and they become the delivery staff of something that can perform an epic challenge. This lets us kill enemy support characters like Imperial Officers or Necron Lords. This gets rid of a force multiplier in the enemy army. Or it forces a Necron player to spend their valuable command points to press Ctrl Z and undo that. Something we know only too well from other videos. The videos I mentioned here are linked in the description. Deploying the Gene Stealers near the Reductus Saboteur is a really good combo if we don't get the first turn. Because if something really fast is coming for them in a sort of Uno reverse situation, having the Saboteur nearby will blow up some of them, or if the target was the Saboteur all along, then the Gene Stealers can screen for her while the Reductus performs actions. I keep the Ridge Runner safe in turn one. We can't use one with darkness on it, so it is vulnerable to enemy indirect fire. It can scout, and on turn one, it can perform actions to complete secondary objectives. But what it is really doing is waiting to be a support unit. When the Neophytes and the Acolytes come in for the kill, that extra AP is nice on demo charges, but very tasty on the neophytes. When we are stacking crossfire with a perfect ambush, which is a battle tactic so the Nexus can use it for free, the neophytes become AP minus two. That is halving the save of a Chaos Marine or wiping the save entirely from a unit like Imperial Guard or Tyranid Termagants. And the Termagants won't have had a chance to scurry away because, as per Deep Strike, we're not deploying within 9 inches of them. Tau also get very sad when they're told that their Fire Warriors, if they take a strike team of Fire Warriors, or their Breachers, that they thought were going to get a 3 plus save and cover, and now on a 6 plus save. The minus 2 from the Ridge Runner and Stratagem, the Ignore Cover either from the Ridge Runner Scanner, or from the Detachment Rule to Ignore Cover when coming from underground. The Mortar on the Ridge Runner can be used from pretty much anywhere, so you can keep the Ridge Runner safe. Or we can fire the heavy stubbers at the target to give support while the missiles or the heavy mining laser fires at something else big. Remember when you're doing your shooting phase to shoot with the ridge runner first, otherwise the bonus won't confer. Don't get excited that the time is nigh. The cultists rise up, quite literally. At the end of the movement phase, you need to remember to now go back to the ridge runner, not the acolytes or neophytes that just popped up. The shooting phase order is ridge runner, then Acolytes, because they are going to use a perfect ambush stratagem. Then the Neophytes can use the perfect ambush stratagem again, even though the Acolytes have already used it, because the Neophytes have the Nexus in the unit. Remember that order. Write it down if you need to. For a lot of units, I find it very valuable to write down a series of Army Special Rule, Detachment Rule, Unit Rule, and then other bonuses. Brackets. Stratagems. So for a Proteus kill team, the Army Rule, is this the Oath of Moment target? Am I getting full rerolls to hit? Then, detachment rule, did I pick for this to be the turn when I get lethal hits or sustained hits or precision? Then the Proteus kill team gets plus one to hit against a target that isn't below half strength. Then I need to decide if I'm going to use any special ammunition or if I have something like a dreadnought nearby to give them reroll hit rolls of one. That's the other bonuses. When the unit of Acolytes attacks, the Gene Stealer Curl Army Special Rule isn't going to do anything here because it doesn't give us any bonuses to attack. The Detachment Special Rule gives us Sustained Hits 1 and ignores cover. Very nice on those demo charges. Then Unit Special Rule, so we get to re-roll some hit and wound rolls depending on where the enemy is, and we have the Primus with us to give us full re-rolls to hit. Then are we using any stratagems? Things like the Perfect Ambush to get plus one to hit and an extra AP. Then the Ridge Runner is also giving us with Crossfire an extra AP. If you need to, Write these all down. There's nothing more annoying than seeing your perfectly planned strategy fall apart because you forgot a couple of steps. Part of the tournament list is also adapting to what your opponent is. We want to control the game, and as Gene Stealer Cult we usually can, deciding where our units turn up, what we attack, where we disappear to, because we can return to the shadows. But we've also got to analyze and counter popular Warhammer 40,000 armies and tactics. The Tau need to be tied up quickly because of the amount of shooting they've got. And we can delay their shooting further by using one with the shadows as many times as possible. The Eldar need to be tied up because of their speed. This is why the Gene Stealers are super valuable. Most Eldar units are not amazing at close combat, at least not the ones appearing in tournament lists. So if you can tie up the enemy Wraith Guard, they've either got to fall back and miss a turn, 
while the rest of the army tries to deal with some gene stealers, or the Wraith Guard get left behind while the rest of the Eldar army moves up to fight. Orcs can be quick, and because we have a lot of anti-shooting stratagems, we suffer against combat-based factions. You're going to have to wait a turn to see where the Orcs go, and then we can target one flank. And though it is dependent on the deployment map, forcing the enemy to move lengthways to get to your units is slower than moving down the width. If the enemy get close, but not close enough to charge, or they fail their charge, we can return to the shadows with two battle line units. Do remind your opponent of what you can do. Even if you don't win, I would love for Von Karmin's darlings and viewers to be known as fun players who win more best opponent awards than first place trophies. But these tactics should help. If you are just reacting to your opponent, don't leave it too long to score from turn two. If you are going first, then a turn three strike against enemies on objectives will only leave you with one or two more turns to score back against them. And although it can be fun to kill the enemy, we're doing one turn with extra killing. After that, you must focus on objective control to look at scoring, unit placement, and prioritizing targets to secure victory. This is why we have neophytes. Maybe when you come back on the board from returning to the shadows, you see an opening. Only half an objective is covered, so you can use tunnel crawlers. Remember, this is probably turn three or four, so after using it in turn two with the acolytes, we can use it again on the neophytes in later turns. And they have objective control too, necessary for taking and holding those objectives. You don't even need to fight, you just need to turn up. This is also why acolytes can be good combat units. Yes, you blow something up that's a high value target, but also try and do so far enough away so that the acolytes don't immediately get shot by everything in the enemy army. In subsequent turns, they can then charge an enemy on the objective. This is why we have the mining weapon. They also have objective control too, that lets us hold onto an objective even if a bunch of the acolytes die in combat. Remember that the demo charge people also have claws, assuming that they survive the hazardous test from using the demo charges. So I know there'll be a lot of people who need to see this video, so you can put a comment with your 1000 point list, but what I would really like you to do is keep this video in the back of your mind, and when someone you know or someone on Facebook asks about a 1000 point list and its tactics, you can link them this video. And if you want to see some other good unit recommendations, but more generally, this is the Gene Stealer Cult video for you, my darlings and viewers. Have a great day in competitive 40k.